Welcome, everyone. I'm Misty McCall, Executive Director of Villages of Summerfield Farms. Welcome, Victor and Alan. Alan is a resident of um, Armfield. He and his family have been here since 2009. They have three children, and his wife, Tina, has um, stayed with him as well, and he's a pastor at Definition Church. He graduated from UNCW, Southeastern Baptist Sem Seminary, and Garden-Conwell Theological Seminary. He received his doctorate of ministry degree in leadership and organizational development in 2011. He loves living in Summerfield. He says that it's it's sort of feel it feels like you're in the country, even though you're in the city. And he loves living in this small town in Summerfield. And he loves being outdoors and nature and enjoying the, the beauty that surrounds us. Victor Dever, our second guest, is a nationally recognized innovator in town planning and neighborhood design, rural conservation, and street design. He's a native of North Carolina. He's led more than 200 planning projects around the world. He lectures widely on the topics of livable communities and sustainable development, and was awarded the John Nolan Medal and named Fellow of the American Institute of Certified Planners. He co-authored with John Massengill the breakthrough book, Street Design, The Secret to Great Cities and Towns. Victor is an adjunct, adjunct faculty member at the University of Miami, past president of the Parks Foundation of Miami-Dade, and a board member of the National Recreation and Parks Association. The work of Dover Coal Partners has been featured in every major textbook on town planning published in the last two decades, including Randall Arndt's Rule by Design. I'd like to turn over the mic to, to Victor and Allen and let them take the conversation from here. I hope you enjoy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's good to be here. Nice to meet you, Victor. Thank you for having us. Yeah, I was uh, really excited when I actually got the invitation to come be a part of the conversation because, you know, I've been in Summerfield for years, and I've got a lot of neighbors and friends who live in Summerfield who are, for good reason, very concerned about how our town is going to be developed and making sure it's done right. And so when uh, Misty reached out and said I could just come ask questions, I thought, well, this is, you know, such a great opportunity because it seems to me in all the meetings, there's so much uh, misinformation seems to be a lot of confusion it seems like you know I, I think people just want answers and uh, they have a lot of real concerns so I really appreciate you being willing to listen and and I think everybody listening and those who will listen to the recording will appreciate uh, kind of getting the answers they're looking for thank you so much for doing this yeah you know Alan uh, I, I have the privilege of getting to work on projects like this from all around all, all, all over the place and right. Uh, and I've seen it from both sides, you know, about half the time, maybe more than half the time, our firm is tasked with uh, working on behalf of the local government or the mm -hmm. community group. And the developer is on the other side of the table. Right. The investors are on the other side of the table. And I'm very uh, sure that this uh, concern, the concerns that people have are normal and they're, right. and they're justified because right. The, this is a, these are big decisions. You know, sure. some of these are decisions, you know, there's lines on a map, right? But no, they'll reverberate for decades or centuries. Right. So you wanna get it right. And where you're not sure about something or you've heard a rumor or what have you, you're right to be concerned. Right. So the fact that people are tuning into this or watching the recording tells me that they're, they wanna know. You know. They wanna know right. what, what's really in it, what does it really do, how does it really work? And some of this work is very technical. You know, right. the, and so well, we'll just have a conversation about it and try to break some of that down and simplify it and make it easier to, to follow. Um, but basically, people who are concerned about their built environment and their natural environment are concerned about the right things. So yeah. we want to help them through, get the right information. I think at the, at the end of that, if, um, if uh, they get all the facts, but a lot of people who are initially alarmed or concerned or, or have heard a rumor, might find they there's a lot to love about what's being proposed here right well i appreciate you saying that because you know all of us who live in summerfield we moved here because right. we like it like it is mm -hmm. um so there's a there's a that's a high value i think for most of our residents and really for me one of the appeals to this development plan which was appealing to me initially is just 
so much of what I love about Summerfield and riding through Summerfield and running through Summerfield and just being here, I feel like this plan helps us to preserve that. So, I, you know, I just appreciate you acknowledging how important this is to everybody. This is their home. This is where they're raising their families. Absolutely. They're very emotional about it and they should be. And uh, so I'm glad to be able to have the conversation. I, I do want to say though. Wait, let me say, wouldn't it be a far worse problem if nobody cared or and nobody showed true. up, nobody That's asked exactly questions? Right. This is a great problem to have. Right. We would love, I, mean, I think in the end, it'll all be better because people came out and they asked questions. Right. They, um, they you know, quizzed their elected officials about sure. why they were doing this or that. I mean, this is the way it's supposed to work. Sure. Now, that said, the facts help a lot because if we can right. clear up some of the Obviously. misinformation, then I think some of the alarm might settle down and we get into real problem solving. Right. Yeah, that's good. You know, another thing I think is so important, I want to put my pastor hat on for a moment, is we should be able to talk about this. And I just want to encourage everybody watching, we should be able to talk about this and even disagree or debate about the details of sure. how our town is going to be developed in the years to come and still be friends. And you know, one of the real problems well, in America uh, around any number of topics is the, the person who disagrees with me becomes the enemy. Mm -hmm. And often we lose sight of the issue and we begin attacking people. And, and we need to all remember the golden rule. I want to do to other people what I want to be done to me. And, so I hope we can do that in, in this conversation and future conversations so that neighborhoods can get together. You know, our neighbor had a, neighborhood had a meeting recently and, and uh, the truth is I was, um, I'm not sure even what the right word is, maybe disappointed or surprised how difficult it was for a group of adults to gather and to have a, just an honest conversation and to talk about our questions and concerns and to be able to share without it getting so anyway, I just appreciate you being willing to do this. I, I really like that way of thinking about it. If we could visualize, just imagine, it's 10 years from now or 20 years from now, we're looking back on this time. I think everybody will say, this was hard. Right. And this was, this was, this was uh, a tough conversation. The emotions ran high. But what if we could also look back on it and say, uh, the adult leaders in Summerfield right. set an example right. for their children. God, about right. how you work through a problem and exactly. agree to disagree where you need Treating to. Treating each so. other with respect and, right. and the, learning to listen well. Imagine that. If we did that in one town at a time, we could <laughs> heal America. Right, right. <laughs> so if it's okay, can I start with some questions? By all means. So the first question and, and one that I've heard several people say is this came up last May. Mm -hmm. We voted it down and we brought it up the next day. Why? Why so fast? Why so fast? Why sure. again? Well, there, there are a couple of important reasons. Uh, a really important one is that, despite what you might have heard, there was a lot of listening going on on, bar, on the part of David Couch and the development team. And he heard the concerns about uh, garden-style apartments, for example, and people not wanting that. And, uh, and, and I think it might be surprising to people to realize you know, just how much the development team took that on. Right. And so very late in the game, late on the night of the hearing, yeah. David finally had an opportunity to offer a big compromise. And that was to cut the number of apartments down from around 1,200 to 600. And to cut the number of sites where garden style apartments could occur from four to two. And a couple of other important concessions like not having more than one of them under construction at a time. and eliminating from consideration the ones that were right next to single family houses in Armfield and, and oh, Henson yeah. Farms. So those are big changes. Right. But there really wasn't time for that to fully get taken on board. And so it seemed important to bring that back in and say uh, compromise is possible and there's a there's another way we can do this. Right. Now the second reason for coming in that quickly is that as soon as the hearing was over and the smoke cleared, uh, there was a flurry of discussion uh, about adopting new rules that would push way off into the distance, a year or more, um, how long an applicant would have to wait before they could reapply with different conditions. And while that was being discussed, it was, it was important to file another another application before anything like that took effect. So just right. as a practical matter, 
we had to file it. Now, that, so that happened quickly. I was amazed how quickly all the consultants and engineers and everybody could do their work in right. order to get that done. Right. It was very fast. But once that was, the application was made, there's been no rush. There's been plenty of time to have the calm community conversation. This was nine months ago. So we're, you know, we're not pushing this, you know, rapidly through any pipeline of, a, of approval. We're giving the folks in the town, the town council, the town staff, plenty of time to get really familiar with it, understand, ask their questions, do clarifications like the one we're doing tonight, uh, continue the listening campaign. Right. So yes, we filed right away because that was the only practical option, but we haven't rushed it toward the, toward the answer. Yeah, okay. Well, you know, you just mentioned one of the biggest concerns for my neighborhoods. I'm in Armfield and two of the apartment developments proposed in the initial uh, amendment, mm -hmm. we're going to put apartments in both sides of our neighborhood, too close, I think, to our homes. And everybody was concerned about traffic, overcrowding, home values. But what you're saying is in the new text amendment that's been proposed, those two apartments, are they off the table? That's, that's not going to be a thing anymore? That's right. So there were four sites, and two of those sites were on either side of Interstate 73. And the two that are marked with the X's are the ones we're talking about. Okay. The yeah. one on the west side, the left of their screen is uh, the Johnson Tract, and that's next to Armfield West, between Armfield West and, and the interstate. Right, yeah. I can and the see one my... next to it on the other side of the interstate, um, the second red X there is uh, the Beeson Tract. And originally we thought we'd have the garden style apartments be allowed in these two locations as well as the other two that are marked here, one and two. You know, and it, this decision to take them out of, off the table, take them out of play as potential garden style multifamily sites came from talking to folks, uh, standing on the back porch of neighbors uh, in Armfield West and, you know, analyzing together what, what would the implications be, what would it be like right. for them. And so this is a pretty big concession. Oh, that, so yeah, both of those big... sites are out, no longer under off consideration for garden style multifamily, at least which leaves us with two. And the two that remain are the right ones for a couple of really important reasons. The one marked here, number one, is in the uh, commercially zoned property uh, we call Saunders Village. It was once called uh, Penson Village. And that site is close to the interstate interchange where right. people from there making trips, you know, will have a way to get on the regional infrastructure without crisscrossing back and forth across Summerfield's town roads. And the other one, uh, labeled number two in this map, is uh, closer to Summerfield Road in 2020, and 220. And the fact that it's close to 220 means the same thing. People will be able to get on the regional road, get on battleground, make their trip if they need to without crisscrossing through Summerfield. That site is next to the existing trailer park along Summerfield right. Road, if you know where it is. Yeah. Topographically, it's actually down the hill from there. Right. Uh, so it'll, that's also a site where it can have the least visual impact for those right. who are concerned about the garden style multifamily. Good. So no apartments in Summerfield, I mean in um, Armfield, that's huge to know. Well, none of the garden style apartments. I will say, it's full disclosure here, that we have some other types of units that are not just single family houses. We have uh, the, you know, the so-called mansion apartments, which are maybe four or six units in the building, looks just like a house. Right. You know, situated on a slot like a house, sits next to houses. Right. And that would be a good component to include in each of the villages right. where we can find space for it. Yeah. And that way we get to achieve the other goal, which is to diversify the, the mix of housing options so that not everybody has to afford a great big house on a great big lot. And we, that's another way we can, we can do that. So right. we'll have some of those sprinkled through the 11 villages. So another question I think that people have about apartments in general is they don't like how they look at all. You know, people right. are concerned. I've heard a lot about the new apartment complex on 68 and mm -hmm. 73 and some on Horse Bend Creek that are new. Do you, I mean, what will these apartments look like in those two areas where we're gonna allow it? Can you tell us that at uh, this point? I, I can share what we've, what we've done so far, and I think people will be encouraged by it. I want to make one quick clarification, because we'd said yeah. tonight would be about sure. the text yeah. amendment, um, that 
what we're now talking about is what's in the plan for the villages okay, of Summerfield gotcha. Farms and, and what would be part of the development regulations under any that are attached to the agreements that go with any future rezoning. But the text amendment by itself doesn't, doesn't say apartments. It's not, it's not you. set up for that. It, that would be, it's there's a chance, you. there's time to work on that and, um, and add requirements. So my answer for this is very personal. Um, my friend, David Couch, uh, who's uh, developed and managed a lot of apartments in his sure. lifetime, built a career that way, and, and, and notably, still owns and manages most of what he's ever built. Right. So he hasn't just built things and flipped it and run on. He's had to live with the results of what he's built each time. Right. So that's why when you visit their properties, they're carefully maintained, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but when I sat down and David said, we need to find a way to include the garden style apartments in the villages of Summerfield Farms, he had some good reasons. And then one of them was this giving the town a chance to diversify its housing options and uh, solve the problem of fair housing in the town, for right. one. Right. And my response was, as the protector of the design for the villages, my response was, we can do that, but we've got to up our game on the design. We have to make these the best apartment buildings Blue Ridge Companies has ever built. We have to depart from the usual way of doing some of these garden style apartments that, uh, and uh, make them worthy of Summerfield. Right. And that, uh, you can imagine that was a that's a hard thing for my friend David to hear. Yeah, sure. Uh, but we walked through it, one architectural detail at a time, one site plan detail at a time, until nine or ten big adjustments later. I think we've got a great combo where we get to have the garden style multifamily apartments, but they will be a cut above anything that you're used to seeing in that product. And so let's talk about what that means. For example, laying them out in the same way we do the neighborhood not as a standalone complex, but as something that's integrated with the walkable streets and the tree-lined streets. The, my way of saying it is the apartments should have front porches and balconies on them and situate uh, along those tree-lined streets in such a way that it feels perfectly natural for them to be on the, along the same sidewalk that your single family house with the front porch is down the street. So they go together instead of being pushed off by themselves. Mm. So that's a big change. And in order to do that, that means making them architecturally and in terms of how they're situated on their lots, like, it, like you would do it in a, in a village. Conversation distance from the sidewalk to front porches, elevating the finished floors is a very costly item that will, you know, will uh, make it challenging, but we have to do it. Elevating the finished floors on the ground floor from the street side. Uh, and then we went to work on the architecture, fixing proportions, adjusting roof lines, uh, incorporating what we learned from architecture of the Piedmont. And I think at the end, uh, what we were able to come up with will feel like a neighborhood that has apartments in it as opposed to an apartment complex. Mm. I can show you an example of uh, one picture. This is, uh, this is very fa uh, finished looking, but I would say this is a research tool. It's not in the a feature in the text amendment. This is something we would get to talk about again during rezoning in the future if the text amendment is passed. But uh, this is a what if picture for what the garden stall multifamily buildings could look like in the Saunders Village tract. Wow. You're, uh, and you know, so what do you see? You see basically street oriented buildings and mm -hmm. you see the street trees and the kind of uh, site plan layout, neighborhood layout right. that you would expect in the villages. Right. So that brings up another, I think, point of clarification that seems to come up in every meeting I've been like this is, if we approve the text amendment, then we're just giving David a blank check to kind of do whatever he wants and you know we'll have no controls over that. But, but my understanding from talking to some of the town council is, if the text amendment is approved, that then there's a whole nother process of submitting a plan that the planning board then has to recommend again. And then there's another approval the town council would mm -hmm. have to approve again. So there's still a couple more steps, even if this text amendment is approved. Absolutely. And so that's a good this thing. doesn't give David a blank check. There's Far still a it. process. Far from it. In fact, it might, you might even say it's completely the opposite. In what way? Well, so what the text amendment, let's talk about what the text amendment is and what it does okay. for a second. Imagine you've got this 
nice big fat book, that's the Unified Development Ordinance, and you're inserting new pages. That ordinance is divided and divides the town into a series of zones, like the single family residential zone you live in, uh, or the uh, commercial zone where the supermarket is located, for example. So, uh, and it has categories in it that are that have been created in anticipation of future development. A couple of those are designed around the idea that someone might, instead of just developing a lot of land piecemeal, one subdivision at a time, might take a larger property and design it as a unit and save a lot of open space in it. So there are two zones in the ordinance as it is that are called the open space zones. Open space residential, open space mixed use. Those are there already. So what our text amendment does is it inserts another one in that category. We're calling it Open Space Mixed Use Villages, or OSMV. And this one's different from the other zones in some significant ways. But that's all they do when they adopt the text amendment. Let's suppose that following the recommendation of the planning board, which was recommended approval, that the town council does that. What they've done is they've created a new zone on paper in the book. but. That's not yet applied to anywhere on the map of Summerfield. It's only after a later process with another review by the planning board and another vote up or down by the town council that that newly created zone gets applied to land. And of course, we, we plan to use it for exactly this. So we, we worked out the plan for the villages of Summerfield Farms and then we created a text amendment just to make a procedural opportunity to ask again in the future, may we please rezone this land to that new zone? And the, uh, so that's what the text amendment's doing. It's not a blank check, far from it, because all it does is starts another round of scrutiny of a, in additional detail. Now, uh, let's suppose we're, we're skip it, let's go ahead a step. Town council's approved it, now we're asking for rezoning. This zone is different from the other ones that exist, partly in that it requires a whole set of detailed development regulations of, it, of their own, designed by us. These are the quality control tools, and that's the extensive uh, set of standards that controls where a building may sit on its lot, what can be next to what, what the dimensions of things are allowed to be, um, and architectural requirements and landscape requirements and street tree requirements and so forth and so on. So this new zone, unlike any of the other zones that already exists, gets that new set of standards as a requirement. They have to be created and approved by the town council in that act. There's a, a requirement under this new zone for a development agreement, which isn't required under the other forms, under forms of zoning. A development agreement is exactly what it sounds like. It's a, like a contract between the town and the applicant in which they promise to each other what they, you know, they make their promises to each other for the future. It is a binding, perpetual uh, agreement. So in that, um, all of the questions about the uh, way individual phases or get their detailed site plan approvals and the way uh, water and sewer provided and phasing and other, other kinds of considerations are all memorialized there. That is a great thing for Summerfield. State law permits Summerfield to use these development agreements as a way of getting extra control over what happens. More certainty, not less. So this gives the town more control, not less control over the development you're saying. Exactly. And somebody in our neighborhood said, well, what's going to happen is they're going to pass the text amendment and immediately David's going to start selling off pieces. Can he even do, can he sell pieces of it if he wanted to? And if he did, would they have to follow the same regulations and controls that you're talking about? Would that still apply to those new developers if that happened? Great question. The answer is yes, absolutely, of course. Every aspect of the development agreement and every detail of those standards and everything about that rezoning, any conditions that are applied, all of that applies to anybody in the future forever on the site unless the town shouldn't, in its wisdom, in the future someday amend it. 
Okay. Uh, the development agreement, of course, is a mutual document. We require both of them to agree. But the, uh, so I think this is a really great layer of protection for the townsfolk. Because, um, you know, heaven forbid, uh, one of us are hit by a bus while riding our bikes to work, the, uh, you want to be sure that that stuff is all locked in. And it goes to any future buyer or um, you know, to anyone to whom property is assigned in the future, anyone who inherits it. Right. It would all have to live with the agreements that are set up at that stage. Great. So uh, another kind of related question, and this is maybe the next big thing that I hear that people are so terrified about. So my understanding is for this new, everything we're describing, the villages at Summerfield, in order for us to do this, we have to have city water and sewer, correct? You've got to have it or you can't proceed. Is that right? So the villages of Summerfield Farms would have municipal water and sewer. Right. So uh, it's a condition of this whole uh, idea. The, so without the very water nature and sewer, the, we can't do any of this stuff we're talking about. Is well, that, that what you're saying? I believe that what would happen is the development as envisioned can only proceed if water and sewer are provided by a municipal water and sewer provider. Okay. So here's now, the thing people are scared about. Yeah. Who's paying for that? Great. So well, the number one question people are saying, I'm glad. and I've heard this in every meeting. I'm so glad you asked They're going to say, we've got to have it. You have to sign on. You don't get to keep whatever you have. And it's going to cost you, some people say it's going to cost me $30,000 and I won't have a choice. <laughs> well, I'm really glad you asked because what you just said is uh, oft repeated misinformation and it is incorrect. So let's clear it up. Okay, please. If a municipal water and sewer provider cannot be found and an agreement cannot be made with them, the development as envisioned cannot happen and the whole thing unwinds. Okay. But the control is in the town of Summerfield's hands. But we don't even get to the stage where we're talking to a municipal water and sewer provider until the, the rezoning uh, is in hand. So the, the, basically the town of Summerfield needs to indicate that what we see in the pictures of the villages of Summerfield Farms is what they want. Uh, all, in, all, in all respects, the, the villages themselves, the open space preserved, the trails, and the water and sewer. And then an agreement can be made with a provider, a water and sewer provider. That, the, to, the cost of paying for that is entirely on the villages of Summerfield Farms. So the future residents in the villages will bear the cost. Uh, and they will be required to hook up. And no one else will be required to hook up. So I won't even have to hook up, much less pay to hook up. Not unless you... Armfield. That's exactly right. Now... Would our it neighborhood makes sense if the system is installed if you to wanted to do up? it? You so, could. So let's say our neighborhood wanted to hook up. Mm -hmm. Then do I have to pay to hook up? Presumably, yes. No one in Summerfield, that in the existing Summerfield, would be required to join in on the water and sewer unless they just want to. But everybody in Summerfield would benefit because for several reasons. The pressure on your water supply uh, in your individual well fields would be would be locked. It wouldn't, none of the new development under the villages would be drawing water from those locations, from those right. wells. So the concern people have about the existing well and septic systems uh, is, is that, well, isn't going to draw down the water that they need for the existing homes? And the answer is the water won't come from there because it's coming from the municipal system. So that's a really good thing for everybody, even if you stay on well and septic. Somebody wants to join in, they can. Uh, they can they can hook on. And of course there would be an expense for that. Would an individual decide that? Would a neighborhood decide that? Would a town decide that? Well, remember what we've got here, a patchwork of uh, newly created subdivisions like uh, Armfield or Henson Farms or Henson Forest, which have homeowners associations and right. so on. So they get to make a lot of their decisions today as a group instead of individually. But we also have in the town of Summerfield lots of people who just have a lot with a house on it. And if the water and sewer were going by in front of them, they'd have the option to plug into it. If they want to. Or if, a, you know, so why is that a good thing? Well, remember, everybody's fire insurance rates throughout the town, whether they're on well and septic or part of the new villages, uh, would be improved. Their fire insurance ratings would be improved by having 
uh, right. firefighting water pressure, right. for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now, people are paying more for fire insurance than they should because the way fires are fought by the volunteer fire department is they run a hose down into a pond and they drag water out and they go and they spray it until they run out and they have to run back and get another tank. Just think about that for a second. Right. In the future with municipal water and sewer in the villages, there's no, no, none of that uh, process or fear or delay in response. So naturally in fire insurance companies are gonna respond with that and your ratings will improve. Even if you're in one of the houses nearby, that's not on the system. Mm -hmm. Everybody will benefit from the better firefighting capacities. So that's a good thing. And yeah. then let's zoom out a little bit. Everybody in the region, including those in Summerfield and beyond, will benefit from not proliferating more and more septic tanks. It's not a good thing to have a town of nearly 12,000 people where everybody's on a septic system. And wow. the Jordan Lake watershed pollution is partly uh, because of this problem. And it's only set to get worse so let's say there's no text amendment, there's no rezoning, there's piecemeal development of the conventional um, suburban subdivisions. Meaning if we developed the way it's currently right. zoned or whatever. If you did that and you have septic tanks everywhere, you're just taking that ticking time bomb of an environmental problem and making it worse. So again, everybody in the region will benefit from having the new residents be on a municipal well and, uh, water and sewer system. So the last thing to, to mention about this is that the, uh, the new residents who are in the villages, and I bet a lot of people who live in Summerfield today will want to move into them. So maybe people who are already here, but uh, you know, their bill would pay for the cost of, of the water and sewer service, but they won't all move here at once. This is a 20 year project. It's going to roll out over a period of time. And yet the water and sewer system would be installed in significant you know, phases. Uh, and so there is a time when the water and sewer providers are gonna have a lot of upfront construction expense and they're gonna need to p get back revenue from, from homeowners. And yet those homeowners are arriving slowly as the villages are built out. Right. What David Couch has offered is an unbelievably uh, smart deal for every, every, all parties. Because what he has said is they would personally guarantee any shortfall in their revenue during the buildup to having enough customers to pay for those costs. So wow. that's a sort of a backstop against uh, anything going wrong. That you just, let me just say, if this were a small project, 10 or 50 or 100 acres, uh, you wouldn't have an offer like that on the table. So this is a really good thing. And all of it is made possible to discuss only after the text amendment is approved. So we get the text amendment just opens a door that we can go through and, and, and walk down together with the community considering all the details of future rezoning. Right. It doesn't lock in any guaranteed rezoning. So one last question for me, and I know we want to get to the questions for people online. You've done this how many times now in different communities, ballpark? Lots of, well, Hundreds? projects like this, uh, over a hundred and more than that number where we were working for the municipalities. So what percentage of those increase overall home values and what percentage decrease, have a negative impact on home values? Well, I love this question because it sounds like a Dover Coal marketing question. I just want to say for the audience at home, I did not put him up to that. But I can say without any doubt, every single one of our implemented projects have resulted in a stronger tax base and higher property values for the people in the neighborhood and the people surrounding the neighborhood. I'm very proud of that. Really, 100%? 100%. Do you have a ballpark figure for what percentage they would drive values up? No, I, I, I think it would vary all over the place because okay. you know, a lot of times we're working on remote and rural places and sometimes we're working in right. the heart of the old town or right. a downtown you know, next to the train station. So it just depends on where you are. But, the, but I can give you an anecdote. Okay. Um, we had a project in South Carolina where the adjacent neighbors were concerned. We were proposing smaller lots and they were grown up sort of conditioned to believe that a bigger lot with a bigger house on it is the way of preserving property value. Right. And anything smaller was gonna somehow bring that all down. Right. And so they were asking questions about that. They were very fearful about it. 
Um, as it turns out, the lots in the new development are half the size of the ones in the adjacent development, mm. right? Well, after all those design controls and the, including the standards and the careful work of designing the neighborhood like a really livable place, mm. those half size lots were selling for three times as much as the ones in the existing neighborhood outside the fence. And that's six times the price per square foot for so, the land so half under the those size, new houses. Half three the size. times as much. Yes. So how could that be? Well, because the new ones are so good. They were, you know, featured in Southern Living Magazine and they you know, you would stand there and you they they have the all the benefits of a new house in a new neighborhood, like good closets and good plumbing and good roofs and stuff. But they also had the qualities of the best historic neighborhoods, tree-lined streets and front porches and a kind of friendliness and neighborliness, curb appeal, the real estate agents mm -hmm. call it. And that resulted in a kind of prestige or, or uh, you know, an affection on the part of buyers, uh, new residents and, and existing for this new stuff that was being built. And isn't that a good thing to think about? Think about new development, change, growth even, that made things better rather than worse. You can have that. Yeah. You have to have really high standards. But you can get there. I mean, that's my biggest concern because I, I mean, I, in the light of, I think growth is coming because of what's happening at the airport in '73. I, I, you know, I think it's kind of inevitable. So if we can plan in a way that allows us to protect the open spaces that feel, still feels like we're in a rural community, and we can have the trails, and we can have, you know, some of these benefits. Mm -hmm and increase our home value while that growth comes. I mean, it seems like that's a win-win for everybody. There are some other wins, like having a neighborhood where after your kids grow up and go off and get that new you know, young pharmacist degree from Wake Forest or whatever, they can come back and, and have a place that's suitable for them and affordable for them mm -hmm. to live in the neighborhood where they grew up. Yeah, That's a win too. Sure. So, and what about the folks who grow old here, who raise their kids here? They don't want to leave their friends and their congregation right. and yeah. so forth. Yeah. They can stay here. So there are even more wins on, the, on that stack of yeah. wins that you described, That's not good. just the financial ones. That's good. Well, let's get to these questions. First question that uh, somebody turned in is, why is the text amendment required for villages of Summerfield Farms to become a reality? And maybe we've already answered that to a degree. Although I would like to add a detail okay, that, okay. I didn't, that the text amendment specifically has to be done to address. Okay. And I'm just going to share my screen here for, again for a second. I've got a, an image on the screen which we showed. It started as a storyboard image as we tried to, to create a, uh, the idea of the village at Summerfield Farms and turned into this nice drawing by James Doherty. The, the, what you're seeing there is a place where you could step off your front porch and walk down the tree, the tree line sidewalk and meet right. your friend and have right. a cup of coffee. Right. A very you know sort of normal thing in a in a beautiful old historic district in a small town. The very thing that that when Bruce's Crossroads was first built, they were putting it in place. Right. That's the idea. Well, so if you want to do that under the existing ordinance that the town has without the text amendment, there's a rule in there. It says you have to you can't use the same street to access the commercial property that's part of that mixed use that you're using to access the residential part. Well, the whole idea unwinds if you can't really mix okay. kind of the mixed use. And that's just an example. And there are all sorts of other things. Uh, there's a gesture in the existing ordinance toward clustering homes, but it's not set up in a way that a developer could practically use. And so you probably won't get much clustering under that with the goal of preserving the open space because those clustered houses still have to have excessively huge lots. Mm. So we won't actually achieve any of that housing diversity, the income diversity, uh, the age diversity, or the mixed use, and the open space, unless we create another category. Gotcha. And this new category created by the text amendment would allow us to fix those things. Hmm. That's good. Next question, again, we've touched on this, but I, I think it's so simple and clear. What happens if the text amendment passes? The town's ordinance gets a few more pages. Okay. Stop. That's all that that causes. And now there's a zone described in the ordinance that an, an applicant like David Couch can come ask to be applied to property on the map. And that's what we would have to do. 
So, so he would be requesting his land to be rezoned. That's right. And then if that got approved, then he'd have to come with a plan for the whole project. That's right. And so, the planning committee would have to recommend that. Mm -hmm. So the planning board, just, just like with any change to the ordinance or any other rezoning, the planning board would weigh in in their advisory capacity, and then that advice is forwarded on to the town council. They have the authority so to the change the map. So the planning board would be the people that are filtering all the details about mm -hmm. designs, layout, how it looks, the things that a, a lot of the community is has been concerned about. They're kind of that safe keeper. They're the filter for that kind of stuff. The town's in charter the sets them up in exactly that role. And this okay. is a good thing. And I have to say, we've done this in a lot of communities, and you have a particularly hardworking planning board that really took time to read every syllable in the text amendment and ask a lot of good hard questions about it. So this is a good thing. And they're, they're in these matters, zoning and so on, every time they meet and every packet that they open uh, of their, you know, it comes to them from the town staff, every report, they're reading all that stuff. And so your town council gets the benefit of them having gone over it all in great detail and made a yeah. recommendation right. before they have to take it up. And you have some of your planning board members are long serving individuals who've right. been involved for, well, uh, probably since incorporation or nearly thereafter. Yeah. And uh, so if I were a newly elected elected official, I'd be grateful that that group was vetting all this stuff right. and, and holding public meetings about it before it came to my desk. Right. You know, it, since you mentioned that, I think it's good to just say to our mayor, to our council, to our planning board, I know this, this has been a lot. That's right. And uh, and we don't we barely pay them. I mean, it's basically a volunteer job, and they're putting in sometimes 20, 30 hours a week to serve everybody in our community. And I think it's a good reminder for us to make sure that we're being kind and grateful to a group of basically volunteers who are right. just helping us sort through all of this. For me, I mean, that's one of the things that for me has been helpful is trying to trust. There's a group of people that are in the details. And there's a group of people that are protecting me and our other residents. And if they are for it and recommended it, then I feel like I, you know, I can be behind it. So that's, that's well said. Good. Yeah. Next question. Why aren't the planned garden style multifamily apartments included in the text amendment? Oh, okay. Great question. The open space mixed use village zone is set up so that when someone wants to use a particular piece of property under that zoning and they ask for this rezoning, that's when they specify what the exact land uses and building types would be in their development. And of course, that's uh, captured in those detailed development standards and that development agreement that I spoke about. But it's set up so that the text amendment itself is inherently flexible. It gives the the applicant the opportunity to make their case for what the mix should be. So it's at the at the stage of rezoning to um, to OSMV, Open Space Mixed Use Villages, that the uh, land uses like apartments here and co coffee shop there come up, and that's the it's by design. It's the way it's supposed to work, and that uh, is a good thing for the for the town as well. But the in this particular case, David has wrapped his application with a cover memo and promises to the town. That's where he says in advance of the future rezoning, if we get that far, that the garden style apartments will be limited to 600. And that's in the document. It's attached mm -hmm. to the application uh, along with the summary of all the other revisions between right. the, the things that are different, 13 individual right. revisions that are different from the old text amendment that was uh, rejected by the town council. Based on this the feedback one. you've gotten from the town and the town council. That's right. right. Like I told you, the active listening has been going on all along. And so those revisions are designed to address specific things, clarify language people were concerned about. Uh, right. So that's, why, that's where it is. Yeah. So you get both. In this case, uh, the text amendment itself doesn't talk about apartments, but David's own application to create the text amendment does. So we know okay. that it's not going to be possible to come forward if the text amendment passes, right. we come forward in the rezoning, we're not gonna be able to add in more garden style apartments than we're promised there. Right. Yeah, that's 
a great point of clarity because again that's been a big fear is right. if we do this then all of a sudden it's going to change because we've not gotten details well I so love that's that one of the big changes about the new amendment is it has that clarification it does and you know this is the opposite of an anything goes district right it, it is the exact opposite of that in fact what's happening is we're saying that there we believe there will be out there after the ordinance allows it an applicant we know there's at least one that is David Couch is the right, one who sure. has the property that meets the requirements, uh, and he put all the effort into creating this thing. That applicant, David Couch, is going to come forward, and he's going to subject himself to a, a degree of control, those development standards, the strict architectural controls, and so on, that don't exist in any other zone in the town. He's going to voluntarily impose those on himself to guarantee the quality control. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean by it's the opposite of an anything right. goes district. Right. It's going to be pretty tightly locked down. Yeah, that's good. I mean, it's good for residents. It feels like, I think, protection for them, which is good. Well, you know, I think it's good for the investors. I'll just right. speak for them from the other side of the fence here. If I were sitting in, the, in the, the town staff position, I'd be glad to see that because uncertainty is the enemy of investment. Mm. And the uncertainty is the enemy of, of property value. Right. And this is... We're trying to achieve the flexibility that you need to do great things and at the same time give enough certainty that everybody can feel, feel comfortable. Yeah, that's good. A uh, question out of the chat. Uh, the reality is our middle schools and high schools are already at capacity. They're utilizing trailers. How will negative 600 apartments negatively imp impact our schools or any of the development? If, is this going to be a overcrowded problem in all of our schools, not just high schools, our elementary schools, right. all of them. Great question. Uh, you know, there, there are things that you count on the, the school board and the charter school operators and so on to do, and there are things a developer can do. And the most important thing the developer can do is reserve large tracts of land for additional schools. And we've got that baked into the plan for the villages of Summerfield Farms. So we know when the need is there for additional capacity, we've got the land reserved. We haven't put a park on it or put a, a, a commercial use on it or a, a housing on it because we've held it aside just, in, just for this exact reason. So I'm pretty confident that as the need arises for additional school capacity, we will have built into the villages of Summerfield Farms the ability to solve for that. Now, um, that said, the best way to address the concerns about schools is to make them um, integrated with the neighborhood that surrounds them. Like set them up, for example, so that they are accessible uh, by the trail system and by the slow green tree-lined streets from those new residents in the villages um, because we want people to be able to uh, take their kid to school or walk or bike to school without having to fear the the traffic and the you right. know the high-speed road network yeah so we can just reserve a site somewhere we have to reserve a site that's connected and integrated and that's what we've done with the school sites we've reserved one last thing i need to realize that it's in the developer's interest to make sure that the school questions are solved. Why? As we go. Well. Why does he care? Because the developer, let's say the developer would hope to recruit to live here among the folks in Summerfield, uh, some executive from Boom Sonic or right. Toyota or what have you, to choose Summerfield. You don't want them to come here and discover the schools are overcrowded and it's a big problem. Mm -hmm. You want them to come here and be confident. So it's, the de it's in the developer's interest to make sure that the school issue is resolved I so gotcha. you know you're all in this together so you're basically saying that by making land available as the population increases and demands more schooling then the county just steps in and builds it and now there's a spot already in the plan for that to be built well basically. that is a scenario and 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 that is i'd say that that's a probable scenario okay. but let's say in the off chance that the public school system is not interested or doesn't want us doesn't want to solve the problem in that right. way. The land is still there, so it could also be used for charter schools or 
private uh, schools or, or private academies or what have you okay. to address the overall need. Because what the real need at the root of the problem is the number of seats. Okay. Um, and that's, yeah. that's what you can solve when you have the land to do it. Right. Okay. Good. Next question. What uh, would the adoption of the text amendment grant property owners vested rights? Oh, I love this question. I'm not even sure what vested right means. So you well, have to tell us. Sure. Yeah, vested rights are like uh, under the law. It means that you you have it like a property right, and it can't be taken away from you without compensation. Well, the text amendment doesn't vest any rights on anybody. The text amendment by itself just simply adds pages to the book. In, when a rezoning occurs, then there there would be vested rights. So the um, zoning does that, sure. not the text the amendment. The text amendment, there's just no. Uh, universe that, in which the text amendment this causes dumb. vested rights to land on the uh, on the lap of a landowner. That's not the case. So the vested rights, that's a good thing or bad thing? Maybe that's a dumb question. Well, that's right. So, uh, well, you know, this is North Carolina. We're we're uh, Americans, believers in freedom, and protectors of property rights. Right. So we don't we don't treat that casually, and when a local government does bestow a rezoning, they are then vesting. But the text amendment doesn't do that. It's the, you know, the, so at this stage, there's, that the, you asked earlier, was this a blank check? I think this is another right. form of saying the same thing. Um, no vesting occurs as a result of adopting a text amendment. Okay, so that's in the next step. And again, you yes. gotta trust that planning board is, is wrestling with those issues. The planning board's advisory, and the town council holds the authority. Okay. So it's the town council that changes the map, um, and that's important. They they aren't allowed under the law to delegate that authority to anyone else. Okay. Good to know. How will the project affect traffic when we already have crowded roads? Mm -hmm. And and I. I'm not the expert, but I will say you know I read a there was a publication maybe three weeks ago that said Greensboro had the best traffic of any metro in all of America. So we don't typically sit in traffic, but right now I'm in Armfield, mm -hmm. Brookbank, if you're trying to leave at 745, you might have to wait five minutes to pull out on the 150. But if you added a bunch of new residents, if you mm -hmm. add apartments at the, at the place where we've said, you know, that site up there on 73, is it going to create a pra traffic problem, and how do we protect against that if that right. occurs? So there are a couple of things to remember here. First, growth has been occurring all along. You, know, you had 1,100 right, sure. or so residents in 1991, and you're north of 11,000 residents now. So growth wow. has been happening under the piecemeal uh, you know, low-density sprawl process that's been marching along uh, in all the, in the 30 year period. So. As a citizen, I, you know, I imagine that when there are more people and there's um, more economic activity, more value created, more to that tax base you spoke about before, uh, you're going to get a little economic development, you're probably going to have a little additional traffic. That's totally normal. And if it seemed like you were getting, for the camera now, <laughs> th this much progress, economic benefit and so on, and that much additional peak hour traffic at the busiest intersections, that might seem like a fair trade. What everyone's concerned about, I believe, and what they should be concerned about, is if they only get this much progress, but they get that much traffic congestion. Exactly. And that is easy to solve. I can tell you how. The first thing. We need to remember that the single family detached houses on large lots are the biggest producers of traffic per unit of any land use. You know, it's wow. 12 or 14 car wow, trips per day per household. Well, we, we make trips to work, or, or yeah. right? but we also make lots of other trips. We trip to take the kid to piano lessons, trip to get an egg McMuffin, you know, trip to get to, to horseback riding after school, okay. and so on. So by the time you're done with single family detached houses as the mainstay of development, you're just making the most traffic you can make at the peak hour by doing that. One solution is to vary your housing types because uh, Senior citizens and empty nesters, for example, or single heads of households living alone and the people working from home and so on, are not generating the trips like the so-called Ozzie and Harriet households 
like my of the dis of the past subdivisions. Yeah. Now you want both, right? The, the, right. Both and is always the answer in town sure. planning, not either or. Uh, so you already help solve that problem by diversifying the housing types. Okay. Because those empty nesters don't go out and take that same trip at peak hour well, that what? somebody coming to work in the healthcare business would would be making the trip. So the next thing we do is mix the land uses. Because if we can put those things you need like that trip to get coffee, for example, or to meet a friend or what have you, the, the, what the traffic engineers call discretionary trips that are not a trip to work necessarily, or not a long commute across the region. If we can put them close and shorten them, then we can reduce the time and the miles mm -hmm. that everybody's on the roads and the traffic congestion goes down again. So that's why we've got commercial development, some workplaces, and housing diversity baked right in, including that, I keep talking about the example, but that corner coffee shop that might be right in your neighborhood. So you might now, walk instead of drive. Exactly, because we don't just shorten the trips. We take some of them and actually eliminate them altogether where cars are concerned, because they can be made as a neighborhood golf cart trip or a walking trip or a biking trip. And at the very least, even if they're in a car, a short trip within a neighborhood, when that happens, they're not on the regional road network using the same intersection everybody else is trying to okay. use. So those are the, that's the solution. That's how you do it. Well, and you have raises, to build properly to get that result. So that raises another question I've heard. What about all the other services? So let's assume that the traffic's not going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. What about all the other things the town provides with, again, basically a volunteer staff? Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden you've got all these people and all this extra demand. What, is that, what does that mean for the town, town government, size right. of government, well, expense of, of government, okay. taxes? I mean... I love this question. You know, we're very respectful of the founders' vision for Summerfield when they said they wanted a limited services government, or as some called it, government light. Yeah. Um, because they didn't want to bloat the bureaucracy and the budget. And, uh, and so that, that's a sensible idea. It's a, a 21st century way of running town government. But remember how I talked about traffic is one of those things that the single family detached house on large lots generates the most demand for? Well, all of those other things are also multiplied, like the demand on parks, the requirements for public safety. Use an example, if you have a few houses set far apart and someone's gonna, from the, uh, the constabulary is gonna drive their uh, squad car down that street, they have to drive a lot farther to get to it. Somebody's gonna going to come address a heart attack or a fire. Those first responders have to drive past a bunch of other stuff. You know, so the, the distance that you're running, pipes and wires and all the services. Just because it's, it's spread out or versus being more dense. Is that Everything true? is harder to deliver for the local government and more expensive to deliver for the local government when it's all spread all over the place thinly. Okay. Much, much better when it's compact development. And that's the benefit of the villages because you get to have your cake and eat it too by making the development a little more compact, it becomes efficient. But you get to preserve all that open space as part of the deal. That's where this comes from. Okay. And again, you and that's proven to be true in all of these other, the hundred times well, you've done this. Now, we, the hundred times don't all include government light, limited services, governments like Summerfield. We've, we've worked in a number of them though. And I think people come to appreciate the fact that a lot of burdens that in the old cities of the 19th century would have been shouldered by local government are instead shouldered by the developer and by the property owners associations and homeowners associations and um, that you know, spe and special taxing districts. So those, those tools all relieve the burden on the town of Summerfield Town Hall. Right, got you. Next question, if the text amendment is approved, does this open the door to other landowners who had the ability to rezone their property and put apartments up. So let's say, you know, David's agreed to cut it from four to two. But if we pass this, are we gonna all of a sudden have 10 other guys, they wanna build their apartment complex now. Okay. Two important things to remember. Okay. The text amendment as currently written requires that the landowner have a whole lot of acreage. We wrote it to say 750 acres minimum. Why did you pick application. 750? That's a number that would limit the number of times this could be reused anywhere around the town of Summerfield. 
it's too, it, it, we picked a big number, probably a, it's a huge number. We picked a number that there just aren't a lot of users for. Um, and so it's, it's big enough to have everyone feel confident that you've now opened that door for the discussion of the rezoning on the Summerfield Farms properties without necessarily opening it for a lot of other people. But that's not even the most important thing to remember. It still has to go through the, the planning. The apartments are not in the text amendment. Right. They're not a given. The text amendment is, we're being fully transparent. It's being done with the purpose of coming back in future months with all the details of rezoning, sure. including where the apartments are, right. having them in the mix, instead of being prohibited. It's one of the goals, and we're being upfront about that. But that doesn't mean that any other future user would have to have apartments or get to have apartments just because all of the things were right to say yes in this case. Right. So I think there's, remember, the town council has their hand on the valve. No rezoning occurs without them wanting to do it. So you create the text amendment, Yes, it's possible that a landowner could apply, um, but they, there's nothing given about what they might eventually find gets approved. It's, or if they can even get their land rezoned. That's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So the text amendment merely sets up the, the doorway through which we can enter another phase of detailed discussions that are very site specific. I want to say that if the town felt it would be better to pick a smaller number, for the minimum acreage of an OSMV, open space mixed right. use village, uh, they could do that. And you know, the, that's in their hands. What would be the advantage or disadvantage? Again, are you just limiting the number of times the town has to deal with this? I mean, is that the general idea? Well, it's certainly the justification for making it as big as 750 right. acres. But, uh, but you may find, as a town, that uh, this is a good thing, and you would like to use it again. And the 750-acre minimum could be a limitation that they want to pull back on. So I we think could, we could approve the text amendment, and then we could come back five years later if we like what we are seeing, and somebody's got a 300-acre lot, then we might would amend the text amendment so that they could do something similar on their 300-acre lot. But still, they right have question. to go through that same process. Right, so the text amendment is just the technical term for a landowner asking, can I offer a suggestion for how the ordinance should be revised? But those suggestions can come from the planning board, the town staff, or town council member. Okay. Any citizen, landowner in Summerfield has the, uh, has the right to offer a text amendment. And uh, so uh, David's offered this one. Once the, the town council adopts ordinances, those are uh, those didn't come down from the Almighty. Those are creatures of humankind, right. and they can be changed. You know, sure. So they could change their mind. They could decide that they want to adjust their requirements or heap new requirements on a, on such a on another development like you're describing, right. some other future development, in exchange for a lower acreage minimum. Yeah. And that's that would be within their power to do so. Right. But only the town council has the ability to modify the text of the UDO. So in the end, even though David's the applicant and we, we wrote this amendment, on the night they approve it, they become the authors and we were just scriveners. Right. It's theirs and it's theirs to revise. However, after rezoning and the adoption of the development agreement, any revisions to that in the future have to be mutually agreed on by the landowner who's inherited that agreement and the town. So there's an extra layer of protection right. for the town. For both parties. For both. Misty now for questions, people joining us. How are Hi. You doing? Hi, You're everyone. Um, I'm back and we're going to ask a few live questions. And I see, let's see, I see Dina Barnes. So I'm going to allow her to talk. So if you'll press your unmute button, Dina, and ask your question, please. Actually, it's not Dina, it's BJ on Dina's computer. Uh, <laughs> Hi, BJ. How are you doing? Great, talking. thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm gonna to let you ask your question and then turn it over to Victor and Alan and let them answer. All right, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate the information, appreciate you guys being there and taking uh, questions and, and giving these answers. One of the uh, questions that I get asked a lot by citizens, and I'm a 40 year resident here, by the way, and uh, not only was I sure for 24 years, but mayor for a term. And uh, I appreciate the fact I had the opportunity to serve 
my neighbors out here, family and friends who live in the in the area, are, are wondering if this text amendment does not pass, for example, if it was not to go, uh, could David and would David have the option of selling his property, splitting it up into smaller tracks, some other developer come in who is not committed to the vistas and open spaces that uh, David is committed to and could actually just build little, little uh, developments and, and then one, destroying those vistas and and uh, the visuals that everybody seems to be trying to save, or not everybody, the people who are adamantly against this are trying to save. So BJ, your question was, if the text amendment does not pass, could the lands be sold off one at a time and brought through for their own uh, development approvals? And the answer is, of course, yes. And, um, I, and I think for, for me, that's one of my biggest concerns is that, you know, I think one of the advantages we have with working with David is that we've got a resident who's invested and been here for a long time and, and uh, I think cares more than just a general developer who's trying to make a living. And I think the thing when I first saw the overview of the plans and saw that we were protecting all of these beautiful spaces, uh, you know, that, to me that's the greatest thing about it and if we don't do it, that, that's the thing we had the most danger of sacrificing. I, you know, I really appreciate BJ pointing that out because I think that's important to everybody. I mean, almost everybody that moved to Summerfield, they moved for that. That's what they care about. And I think the text amendment is actually trying to protect those places for all of us. So, you know, the irony of this project and this, the, whole, the whole discussion, text amendment, all of it, is uh, that one of the things that's al alarming to folks is the very bigness of it. You know, sure. 973 acres, a lot of uh, interrelated pieces of property. Uh, th this will have a big effect, and so everybody is rightfully extra focused on it. But the bigness of it is its strength, mm. because the bigness of it means that when we preserve of a 50% uh, open space, let's say, we can preserve a vast area at one time that's connected to the other mm -hmm. area that's preserved. So mm -hmm. sharing my screen, the, uh, you, I've shown this map a few times of the green network. When y'all, I've experienced this, when y'all give tours to newcomers, the first thing you do is you ride them down Pleasant Ridge Road right. and you show them long views across open space. Right. Um, and you ride them up to Bruce's Crossroads and you show them the, the historic settlement of there and, and in Moorhampton Park. Some people right. don't know that name, that was the, early 1900s name for the subdivision is built nearest to the railroad depot mm -hmm. where the, the cottages and volunteer fire department mm -hmm. and so on are. Mm -hmm. That's, that was a new town uh, planned for this place called Moorhampton Park around mm -hmm. 1911, planned with great ambition, didn't, didn't actually get fully developed. In some ways I like to think that the villages themselves are like the completion of the idea that the founders of Moorhampton Park had, but maybe with a higher standard and with all we've learned in the 120 years since they drew their drawings. But the, if this were just little developments, BJ, uh, done piecemeal one at a time, there would probably be open space preserved. It's like a, it's a thing that um, is a site planning problem solver for developers and a thing that, that someone asking for rezoning knows the town wants to see, hence the way the UDO is written but they would be little pieces and not necessarily connected to each other. And so it'd be great to have open space, but it's even greater to have big continuous swaths of open space. And big spaces that everybody can use. The ones that so you recognize. My, so for example, there's some open space in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I'm sure my neighbors, and certainly not anybody outside of my neighborhood, would not even use that space. Because it's not really designed for that purpose where my understanding is, and it looks like to me the way this is designed, everybody gets to utilize this regardless of where you live in the town. That's the idea. And so, yeah, the, the, the parks and preserves and conservation areas would, this is not fenced off. Right. These would be the trails, all the, the things we've talked about would be open to the public. This is in the gated community. Right. These are, uh, these are traditional villages. You know, real towns don't have those gates. And so, uh, yes, it's public. You mentioned that it's possible to preserve open space and then not have any people even use it or recognize it. That's a design problem. 
right, we design exactly it correctly, right. we can create open spaces that have a lot more value. Right. And they benefit the adjacent real estate more. But if each piece, if you develop it all together, you can do that. Right. But if you sell off each piece, then there's not, it's impossible to do it. So Which you might have green space, but nobody uses it, except maybe the people in that one neighborhood use that little piece. Well, so B, BJ's made that point, I think, pretty effectively, and you've just reinforced it. I would add that the whole thing is pointing out the failure of just planning by the numbers. You have to plan with design, the right. physical place, right. taking into account the topography and the, the scenery and the mature trees and so on. If you just try to plan by the numbers, you know, here's our percentage of this or that, or here's our density in dwelling units per acre, you know, one tenth of a percent different here or there. You might think you're controlling the results and getting what you want because you're manipulating those numbers, but trust me, you have to do the design, not just the numbers. Right. And this is, I would love to hear, but is it, isn't this pretty unique that there's one person with a thousand acres that can create a design this large that has the potential to benefit so many, I mean, yes. this is very unusual, right? It is very unusual, especially given where we are in the world. I mean, there are places in more recently built uh, states out west or, you know, in Florida or somewhere where uh, human beings came to the, uh, those uh, places in smaller numbers historically and, uh, and they have just shown up in big numbers more recently. Right? But this place has been here a long time. That's why I mentioned that 100-year-old Moorhampton Park settlement right. and the even older Bruce's Crossroads. This, this place has a, a more complicated map because uh, you know, the Quakers were coming here as long ago as uh, the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, the, therefore the pattern's a little more complicated. And it means all these maps and design decisions and discussions are also a little more complicated. But it's so worth it to push through this. Because it gives us an opportunity to create a place that that's right. is unbelievably unique. And again, when you think about home values, I mean, that's what drives anything. Anything's more valuable when it's unique, when it's one of a kind, when it's special, right? So that helps us. Yeah, I remember that the developer of a project like this is putting extra effort into the front end. They don't just, you know, speculate on a piece of property, uh, try to get it rezoned and then flip it to an out of an out-of-state, you know, right. national builder, uh, they have to do a lot of design that right. that ordinary process doesn't require. And so, um, I'm hoping that that investment will result in a, in a much, much better result at the end and one that the townsfolk in Summerfield can feel more confident in. Right. That's great. But I like BJ's question. Wait, we, yeah. we spent a long time on it, and I yeah, apologize, Misty, you probably have another one. Yeah. And the next question looks like it is Gary Brown. So I'm gonna allow him to talk. Gary, if you'll just unmute yourself. Gary, you have to unmute yourself. Yes, if the uh, text amendment fails, what will happen to the land? Multiple developers could build it out in about four years. What would that impact be on traffic, school safety services, infrastructure, et cetera? Are there reasonable alternatives that offer the same quality and opportunity? Want me to take a stab at that? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, don't I, think know. I, think I think it is roughly the same roughly question the same BJ question asked BJ because, asked because uh, you, will um, you will still get development. It may happen, it may happen uh, uh, more, gradually more gradually and thus, and thus, and thus less controversial. But you'll still get development. You'll still get development. It, just it, just it just won't be anywhere near as coordinated as, coordinated as if it as was, if it was sub, you know, part of a larger, of a larger uh, uh, overall vision. Overall and, vision. That, that, and that would be a shame because the, the, there's just no there's good, just reason, no not good reason not to, to, to do that do overall that coordinated approach. approach. Hi again, everybody. Okay, so Carla Brewitt had a question, so I'm gonna allow her to talk um, and ask her question that she asked since we didn't get to it. Hold on just a moment. Carla, are you there? Whoops. Hi, I'm here and I probably sound like a broken record, but I haven't gotten any real answers so far. So 
forgive me for asking this question again. Thanks so much for holding this webinar tonight. It's very helpful. My question is, you showed a cute little picture of a market cafe earlier, and then you mentioned that there are some street requirements or restrictions in the current UDO that would not allow you to build that cute little marketplace cafe. And I'm guessing, um, not guessing, but you also mentioned previously that there are other restrictions. Maybe one is the open space requirement. At any rate, there sounds like there's several things that are in the current UDO that won't allow you to build quadplexes, townhomes, and smaller homes. Is there a reason why you won't ask for amendments to those restrictions so that you can build housing types that the people of Summerfield would enjoy and would approve of? Sure, there are, there are a couple of reasons. One is we've, we approached the UDO with great respect because we know how long it took for your uh, committees, a couple of them, and your town council to work through getting to that final document. And, uh, and we thought the most respectful thing to do when we realized we couldn't use the zones uh, that were there to produce the result we've shown you was to leave them intact, to not come in and say, well, you need to change all these different things and change them for everybody all at the same time. Instead, we said, let's create another category We'll build it based on the format and technique of the open space zones, but we'll fix the requirements so that our project is doable. And that way we don't interfere with the, uh, the use or operation of everything else in the UDO that y'all put so much work into. Now, there's a couple of other important reasons. No matter what we do, if we just tweak the setbacks or the lot size requirements or the clustering requirements or what's considered open space, we still won't be able to include the full mix of housing types, like including the garden style multifamily. That is the key to helping the town of Summerfield answer the oft repeated fair housing concerns. So if we're gonna do all this and go to all this effort, we should fix that too. And so, yes, under OSMV, uh, once it's created, we will be back with a rezoning request that does include the apartments. Um, but is isn't just that, you know, that uh, that's a relatively small percentage of the overall development and a tiny percentage of the land, but it needs to be there. And so again, the respectful thing to do was handle that in its own zone instead of uh, starting to mess around with all the numbers and, and uh, systems that y'all wrote into the UDO uh, in the other zones. So those are the reasons. One of those uh, uh, requirements is the one where uh, if you have a mixed-use village, you can't use the street that serves the commercial or non-residential parts as the access or the, for the residential parts. But that doesn't add up to a mixed-use village. In my mind, that adds up to people driving out onto the regional road network, making a left turn, making another left turn to go to the coffee shop, in an area they could have walked there if they or driven there without getting out on the shared roads, if only we'd been allowed to design it that way. So it's a good thing to get that stuff um, fixed through the new zone. Thank you, Victor. That's a great, great answer. Um, I'm gonna call on Paul Riley if he's still here. He had a question in the chat, so I'm gonna allow him to talk. Hold on just a minute, Paul. You can unmute yourself. All right, good. Um, you, you all can hear me now? We can hear you. Okay, um, I just want clarification um, on exactly what type of housing is being planned for that Johnson track that's directly behind Armfield and the Beeson track. And you must be hearing that question. Yes, too, from, I mean, that's yeah. um, a big concern. For it's it's a good one to ask. The, the expectation is that we would, now having pulled off the uh, earlier layout for garden style apartments and other uses uh, on the Johnson track that we'll need to have a new site plan for that. Um, it would be one of the villages, but it would be, it would no longer have garden style multifamily apartments in it. And so that's how far we've gotten. Honestly, um, if there, if it turns out there isn't gonna be a text amendment, it would be a shame to go do a bunch of design and engineering right now to replace that earlier site plan with a new one. 
So I think we just want to get to the next phase, um, and then we can sit down and produce a new site plan for uh, the parcels that are on either side of uh, I-73. And you know that, again, we'll be starting a new process, a new public process. So there's going to be chances to sit down and, and look at that together on the map, you know, talk to the arm field leadership again. So uh, we'll, do, we'll all be doing that together. So one of the things in every meeting I've been in, we go from the text amendment and immediately jump into the discussion about the plan. Mm -hmm. And that's part of our challenge sure. is that we're trying to take the first step. But, are, but is it true that in the, if the text amendment passes and we're in the planning stage, would Armfield residents then be able to give input? How would we give input to what is being designed in that space and make sure that once again we don't lose control and all of a sudden there's something back there that we right. don't want. What would that look like? Well, I'm really glad you asked that. Well, first of all, it won't be immediate. We won't be able to get the text amendment one day and file for the rezoning the next. We have a lot of work to do together. And absolutely, yes, 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 that would mean sitting down again with folks in Armfield and the other neighboring property owners, just as we did to start this process and give everybody a chance to kick the tires on what's being discussed and understand it. So because me, we want to show up. And why, me, why would we, we do that? Let me and be devil's okay. advocate. So you say that, but what if the thing gets approved and you decide, I'm not going to talk to them? Okay. Well, uh, so I hope that's not the case, of course, but I appreciate your asking about the scenario. I personally think, and this is Dover talking, I'm speaking for myself. Sure. If I'm going to show up at the town council, first the planning board and then the town council, and ask for a rezoning, when they ask me, did you meet with the folks of Arm, with Armfield about this latest stuff? I want to be able to say yes. I got you. I want to explain that we had multiple conversations. We improved the plan with that input of our neighbors. Now, let's remember the largest property owner in Armfield is David Couch. He owns the Armfield Club. He owns the un, unbuilt parts of the Armfield sure. subdivision. So it's in his interest to have Armfield on board, wouldn't I much rather show up at the town council meeting with Armfield re leaders and residents on both sides of us standing shoulder to shoulder saying, we did this together and it works and we would like you to say yes. That's gotcha. the goal. So the protection then is the council's not, I mean, we've, the council's already denied this one time. So they're already trying to protect the things that we're talking about. Right. So the protection in the future is still that. The power is in the hands of the town council to deny anything that the residents were saying, we don't want that in our backyard. Right. Basically right. Um, one after another, your elected officials said, uh, we listen to the citizens and we want to do what they say we're supposed to do. And sure. Now we know they're, they're elected and they have a responsibility to think for themselves as well yeah. as leaders. But they said, we heard people say they don't, they're uncomfortable about these apartments and they want these apartments next to their subdivision. Right. So this new application and removing the apartments from the Beeson and Johnson tracks responds directly to that. It fixes it. So I'm hoping, I'm, yeah. maybe call me optimistic, but I'm hoping that when this gets to that stage, if we get to that stage, that everybody will recognize we addressed the very thing they asked us to address. Well, we, we've had people from the council and the mayor visit our neighborhood at least on two occasions to get this feedback. So you know, well, again, I think, I think people are, are just trying to understand the process right. and how to avoid getting in a situation where, I, I, in fact, I think most people look at the plan and go, I love how that looks but I'm scared to death of losing control. Mm -hmm. And that it's really about if I vote for the amendment, then they might do something to me I don't want. And there's, you know, there's just uncertainty about that, so, which is why I think the whole clarity around the next step is the text amendment, the next step is applying for zoning, mm -hmm. the next step is presenting a plan, and, and, and that's where all these conversations are about, the details of that plan. And then again, the city has to, the council has to approve that plan if it's recommended by the plan. So there's just several steps and all of those steps are designed to protect our rights as residents, right? 
They are. So there will, there will be every opportunity for public input that is stipulated by the law, like the required public hearings. But you can be sure there will be more, just like this. This, isn't, this event tonight isn't something we're required to do. We're just doing it to try and be clear sure. and transparent and, and open up uh, the information for people that might be having to rely on the misinformation on right. social media instead of, instead of the real facts. So this, that's why we're doing this. And we will keep doing that. Uh, that's, uh, it, it's the only way we can get to the result we really want, which is everybody standing together saying, we all got something we want. Now, not everybody right. got everything they wanted, right. but we all feel like in the balance, this is a thing that can go forward. Well, okay, maybe not all, because it's America. And as sure. you pointed out earlier, we are a little divided. Sure. So we may still, after all of this, and even after all the input and refinements and feedback and corrections, we may still have people who would rather agree to disagree. Sure. But that's also the American way. Right. So um, the text amendment is really just letting the good ideas have a chance to see the light of day. Right. Okay, guys, we're going to ask two more questions. So thank you for those great answers. It's it's a Great dialogue, and we're all appreciative of it. I'm going to call on Priscilla Olenek. I'm going to allow you to talk, Priscilla, and ask your question. Priscilla? Hey, guys. Good evening. Hey, Victor. Good evening. Hey, Priscilla. Um, so, uh, Gifter, um, Victor, I admire your skill, of course. I think you know that. Um, Doing and great, tech. Priscilla. Keep going. Uh, but I do have a couple of questions because the community is, you know, pretty aware of what's going on, and we're pretty knowledgeable about the situation. And I just want to just get you to confirm, please, for me, that the text amendment, as you state, is the gateway to open the doors to this. And this situation is very different from most rezonings where we know the intent of what Mr. Couch plans to do. And you guys have given us enough information that we have come to the conclusion that there will be 600 apartments, uh, which does not include the uh, mansion style multifamily. Uh, so that could be considerably uh, more apartments. Uh, we also know that this density is three and a half times what our typical allowed density is in Summerfield is at 3.62 units per acre. Uh, we also know that it will be approximately 33 acres of apartments. And if my numbers are correct, about 3,500 additional homes. Uh, so in this situation where yes, the text amendment is the gateway for you guys, um, I would appreciate the honesty if you'll answer, please, if all those things are true. And if you will also speak to the fact that no one is keeping David from developing his land right now, uh, his 973 acres. Uh, he could have developed it, you know, for however long he's had it, 30 years or whatever. And I would like you to please um, acknowledge the fact that the community has clearly said no apartments. And I'm wondering if you guys would be willing to produce something that the community as a majority would support. Thank you, guys. So there are at least three things there. Alan, will you help me make sure I get them all? Okay, I'll try. I'm, that was a lot. All right, so the first one was uh, the, the big picture thing that uh, we anticipate that if there is a text amendment and it passes, that when we come back to ask for a rezoning, that then we will be bringing forward a project that has maximum 3.62 dwelling units to the acre. Yes, that's correct. Um, the text amendment doesn't have a density in it. It's not the text amendment that sets that ceiling. The text amendment does things like require the neighborhood meetings we talked about before. It, it requires us to do the, the process, the gateway or doorway is just to start to get permission to ask for rezoning to something that resembles what we've drawn. So uh, it's, not a, it's not a guarantee that the town council will approve it as proposed in the rezoning stage. Uh, it, I would say it's certain given required neighborhood meetings, the, the 
vigorous public process that you have here in Summerfield, it's, I'm sure there's going to be a whole round of give and take about the rezoning. But yes, what we envision coming back to uh, for, uh, if the text amendment allows for it, is uh, a rezoning that would have, a, have denser development be possible and all the other things that have been described also be possible. No. And one of the things that I think... That was the first again, question. Right, and, and related to that question, for me, I feel like we all have to decide whether we value the density requirement the most or if we value the open spaces in the rural field the most because it, my understanding is we really can't choose between the two. So David can develop it today under the current ordinance or zone or whatever, but if, and maintain the current density requirements. But if he does that, we lose most of those green spaces and all the things that the rural field that we're trying to protect would go away because it would just all be a bunch of neighborhoods and you wouldn't have those big open spaces. By increasing density in small pockets and villages, that allows you to protect more of the natural space, right? And more connected, and then more in the right places. Let me give so you an the, illustration. So, so I think the point is just, it's not that David can't. I think the question we all have to ask is, if he did, would it be better? Because right. in my mind, if he did, it wouldn't be better. We would, I think so many people, and, and I don't, don't mean to speak for everybody, so I'll just speak for me. I know for me, I came to Summerfield in part because I liked feeling like I was away from the city and I was mm -hmm. kind of in this rural area. And I think this type of design protects that. If David just develops it all under the current ordinance or sells it all and somebody else does, I feel like we lose that and now everything's just a big neighborhood and we don't have those wide open natural connected spaces. And I think that is, to me, it's the most valuable part of Summerfield. Well, that is, that is exactly right. And so, Priscilla, I think that second question about is there anything that's keeping David Couch from just developing under the, under the existing ordinance sometime in the 26 years he's owned this land? Uh, and uh, no, that, but I will say that following the timeline of that period in which first there was the comp plan to be created, then there was, as recommended in that comp plan, a UDO to be written, and then there was a UDO consultant hired, and then the time went by and the UDO consultant was terminated and then another one was brought on and it was redone and then it was about to get adopted and then it was yanked back. Through that whole time, uh, Mr. Couch and I would say probably other landowners in, in the town have been patiently waiting for the rule book to settle down. And this is why uh, it, you know, it, it, only now do we come forward with a, with a text amendment to get that rule book right uh, by making this addition to it and bringing forth development. But imagine if this, that big stripe of property that I keep showing the map of was divided up into a checkerboard of smaller sites to be developed one at a time. That's just basically repeating the process under which uh, the, the farm at Summerfield uh, cul-de-sac subdivision immediately south of us here was developed. So that process could be repeated. And if that happened, what any developer of one of those small pieces would do is find where the soils are best for septic, find out where the land is the flattest and where there are the fewest things in the way, like mature trees, trees and so on. And that's where they would put the bulk of the development. Right. So doing it as a big picture hooks together the economics of the piece you preserve as open with the economics of the piece you get to build. But you can't that's, have that's that what without increased density well, I in believe, some spaces. I believe so what's happening the is the density is unlocking your ability to do all those right. excellent things. Right. By hooking their fates together, what you're doing is you're saying it's, in my, it, it's it, possible uh, the, in the economic interest of the developer to leave some of the best, highest, driest, flattest, west, best drained land undeveloped because of the overall benefit it so everybody generates. everybody could enjoy it. And not just to the immediate adjacent new neighbors, but to right. the whole town. And, and that's huge. And when you do this, you still have the other in all of the existing neighborhoods that are already designed that way, if that's a value for you. 
That's and true. My neighborhood's already that way. So There's it's already both a lot and, of that not either or. Right. You'll always have that. Now let's go to the the, the last one. The third question was, uh, can uh, there be a development built that uh, you know does what the what the people want? In other words, builds out the people's business as the people have defined it. Well, yes. That's exactly what happens in our representative democracy when your town council, duly elected members, vote for something. You know, they are uh, being the leaders. They have to decide what's in the best public interest, the balanced public interest after hearing everything from all sides. And the truth is, they inevitably, and a hard uh, question of the, this, this month it's, the hard question about Summerfield Farms, or our text amendment, another month is a hard question about something else. They aren't going to please everybody. And you won't necessarily get every single person to sign off and say, I totally agree with every single thing. Because that's not the way it works. And I think the, the founders of the town and the founders of the country understood that that's the way. That, that this is going to have to be um, a moment of, um, uh, I would say, uh, strength and and thoughtfulness and to some extent political bravery on the part of your elected officials you know are gonna have to take in the information and make the best decision they can make on for the benefit of everybody now, that doesn't mean that they are gonna satisfy every single uh, commenter or complainer it's just that's not the way our system works in in the meetings that I'm in and you know I think one of the challenges in this kind of conversation is the attempt to speak on behalf of, mm -hmm. and that's, that's always a hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. But when I'm in the, the most of the meetings I've been in, so much of what people seem to be most emotional about turns out to be false information. Again, very similar to the political arena in a larger scale in, in America. I mean, I, I, I was in a meeting in my neighborhood recently, and somebody suggested that town had just spent $28 million on studying water. And what, it's like 28 million, the town's never had $28 million. And, and it's like there's things like that that are just these kind of wild bombs thrown into the crowd and everybody goes, oh no, not that. And so I think when we say nobody wants it, for me, I feel like what they don't want are the same things none of us want. And aren't a reality, it's more a fear of the unknown or the what's not real. It's almost an irrational fear about some things that just aren't true. Again, like the idea that we're all going to have to spend $30,000 to hook on water any moment. It's like, if that's true, man, I'm afraid. If it's not true, then I, you know, I don't want to base decisions on a fear that's irrational. Well, there's, there's, there have always been rumor mills, and there's sure. always been misinformation and disinformation, um, and and uh, people have always picked a subject to you know to sure. get upset about, and then tried to get other people upset about it too. It's always been that way. The in our modern times, uh, one of the the realities we're grappling with is that uh, the internet and social media amplify in a kind of exaggerated way, uh, a small number of voices. Mm -hmm. And um, that is something we're all learning to come to terms sure. with. We don't, we don't believe everything we, re we read on the internet. Sure. Um, and I think in this case, there have been some, you know, some shouting social media posts in all capital letters and so on that, sure. to, that are really uh, trying to rally people to one side or the other that, that uh, aren't helping because uh, you know, it's hard for the average citizen to take the time to do the research and, and get to the bottom of what's really factual and what's, uh, what's just a, a rumor. That, that, that whole thing about vested rights that came up earlier tonight. Right. Um, that couldn't be farther from the truth, but it floats out there as a, sure. a fear-mongering thing. So, okay, it's human nature. That's, sometimes that happens. And it's, well, cooler heads just need, need to take the time, get the facts, you know, watch this recording. Uh, that's why. That's why we're doing this. Sure. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to do it and answer so many questions. Do we have some more? One more. Good. Okay.
One more question. Um, I'm going to call on Gary Brown. Did you, can you unmute yourself? Yes. Gary, uh, Gary? I think this has been a great forum for discussing the important current questions and issues at hand. Uh, thank you both very much. Victor, I, I don't think I was very clear in articulating my previous question. My concern is yeah, that if the amendment fails, it could, in reality, be the gateway to a dramatically accelerated build out by David or multiple developers without the appropriate controls provided by the text amendment and resulting in negative consequences for the community with regard to safety, traffic, schools, et cetera. Is that a potential scenario? Well, I won't, I won't speak for David. I'll let him answer that question in, in himself in due time. But I would say any investor who waits a really long time to, and, and explains and adjusts and you know, invents and perfects and designs and hires expensive people like us to help figure it out so it could be as good as it could possibly be, if they are never allowed a way forward for the good things to occur, they're just perpetually frustrated or, or stopped at every turn, eventually anybody would throw up their hands and, uh, and just try to figure out how to you know, let it go. And I, I pray that that does not happen here. I won't speak for David. I, I think the, um, you know, the, the benefits are too good for the community from uh, going forward this way with the text amendment to miss this opportunity. I hope you don't miss it. You know, I, I didn't tie this back before, Gary, but since I know you had a lot to do with the creation of the comprehensive plan initially, uh, there's an, there are ideas in the comprehensive plan that we're trying to honor with the text amendment, like to create a, a really economically viable way to preserve those long rural vistas along your scenic roads, or to produce a really economical way to maintain the town's quote, overall low density. And that's exactly what we are trying to do. Um, so I hope people will catch on to that and we'll never have to worry about the nightmare scenario you, you raised. Yeah, and, I, and I'll just add to this and I, I'm not sure how relevant this is, but again, one thing that has been you know, from the very beginning when we started talking about this years ago, um, one of the things that stuck out to me is I felt like David basically was the person who had the most to lose. And uh, if he's the largest landowner, then I think he naturally wants to do what is in the best interest of property value. So in my mind, if he's the person that's most invested, you know, I felt like that was the person I should trust because he has the most to lose. Can I add to that? Yeah. I believe everything you said is true about the business part of this, but there's something right. else at work here, which is that David and Stephanie and members of their team that live here and work here on Summerfield Farms are so fully attached emotionally in their heart to this land. Right. That they are doing unbusinesslike things, like putting up with um, right. <coughs> a lot of um, um, uh, commentary and right. so on that uh, would would make a someone who's only in it for the bottom line business right. part of it would make them throw up their hands and walk away. Well, but they I, have they was... have per persisted because they're just deeply, deeply love the land. And I, my own experience was that. Uh, in January 2020, uh, in the dead of winter, David walked me and Joe Cole over a two-day period every inch of all these properties, right. up and down hills and under fences and over creeks and whatever. And as we went, he would describe this, that tree and that tree fell over here and then the, that this is the way that right. creek is working. and. He took us to the place where he, you know, every time we turned a corner, he showed us another piece of the land right. and why he loves it. Right. So I do believe there's more here than just the bottom line right. for the business, on, in the business sense. Yeah, and I was, I was gonna add to that, that's where I started. And then over the years, I've gotten to know David more. 
and I know a lot of people who know David very well. And, and I, I, I just think it's unfortunate that, again, so many times we go from the issue to trying to attack people and their character and all these things about them. And, and I, you know, I experience that sometimes as a leader. I'll probably experience that this week because I'm on this talk. Um, <laughs> I know our town <laughs> leaders have experienced a lot of that through the years, and I think that's unfortunate about our town. And, and I'll just say this about David. I know people who work for David. I know people who have worked with David for years and years and years. I know some of David's very closest friends. And everybody that knows him that way says he's gracious, humble, generous, kind. And not only David, but everybody in his company treats them that way. And so I just, you know, again, even if we disagree about everything we've talked about, and, and, and I'm, I know there are people on both sides of this issue listening, we need to care about each other, and we need to know we're going to continue to be neighbors, and we need to do it with respect, and we need to try to listen and try to understand. And, and somewhere, you know, we're going to find our way, but we've got to stop just trying to hurt each other in order to get our way. Well, we are this close. We're a couple of weeks away from a momentous, you know, epic right. and monumentally important moment in front of the town council that doesn't change anything other than setting the stage for another monumentally important yeah, conversation sure. to follow. But we are this close to looking back on that on that day and saying look at that people came together it worked out right. and that uh, I'm, maybe i'm ever the optimist but for all the reasons you mentioned <laughs> sure. i can't help but be optimistic yeah well thanks again for giving us the time and allowing me to be so kind of blunt with questions and all the answers i know were so helpful to so many people so glad to do it appreciate it